So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for putting this fantastic conference together. I've learned a lot, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come back to ICAP and, and tell you a little bit about some of our experiments we did in the last uh, few years. The question I want to ask is uh, basically from our experiments that we do, what can we, what is the information that we can extract? How can we extract them in a way that is non-subjective and as based on mathematical models and what can we learn about the system and uh, its uh, theoretical descriptions? So what do we do in old in cold atom experiments? We usually take pictures. And if you, the best thing you can do is to measure every atom, its internal state and its position at some specific time. And for example, that's an image of, in every of these dots is a single atom. That's an image of a parametric oscillator which produces twin atom beams, about 100 here and 100 here. And um, so you can do that in time of flight, or you can measure momentum. You can do the same thing, was done, achieved about the same time, in situ in an optical lattice, where you basically have the position of every atom there. And so what do we measure in here? It's basically a single shot measurement of a many body wave function. And it's more or less an endpoint correlation function that we measure. Now the question is that what information is in these pictures? And what I want to convey to you is that for the moment, I think, we throw away most of that. And uh, if we really want to know something about our many body systems, we have to learn how to extract optimal information from these images. And I think looking at correlations and correlation functions and how they factorize, and at each order, which is the new information that comes in at these higher order correlations, is a very systematic and very well developed in quantum field theory and, and high energy physics and cosmology method and also solid state physics method that how to extract this type of information. So, uh, the out, maybe I would like to start from here in a fundamental paper that Schwinger wrote, you know, long, long ago, where basically stated that if you know all order correlation functions, it's equivalent to solving the problem that you have. Of course, in our experiments, we can never see all orders correlation functions because we have a finite resolution. Basically, in the real world, the observer will measure only a finite number of these correlations, and they usually describe the propagation and scattering of excitations. And these ideas were basically the foundations of where to develop all these diagrammatic approaches of solving many body problems. To approximately solving the problem, one needs to define the degrees of freedom where only a few or the lowest order of these correlations are really relevant. And if one finds the degrees of freedom, or the basis basically, where these correlation functions factorize, that's equivalent to diagonalizing the many body Hamiltonian. And in an experiment, and its readout always has a finite accuracy and has errors. And you know, you, you need to have clear signatures that what we can learn from the experiment and what is a fair comparison to the model. I think some analysis like that would be very important also if you want to find out what can you do with quantum simulators and what can you not do with quantum simulators. So uh, the outline of my talk will tell a little bit about how quantum fields, the phases that we measure in our experiments and the excitations that we have in our, our quantum fluids are related to each other and then I will give an example and that will be the quantum psi Gordon model, one of the pet models of quantum field theory, where, which can be built, or which emerges out of, the, of two tunnel coupled 1D superfluids. I will say how we can quantify these correlation functions, quantify the correlations in the system, quantify the topological excitations in the system, and really verify that these two tunnel coupled superfluids who have a completely different microscopic Hamiltonian can, are a quantum simulator of the, of the sine Gordon model. And if I time, I talk a little bit about false vacuum states in the sine Gordon model. And in, in an outlook, I can say something about what happens if you do non equilibrium physics in the sine Gordon model. There are many open problems. And if there's time, I might answer one of the questions that Bill asked in the Rydberg 
think the question is that if you can see recurrences in the non-equilibrium evolution. So uh, correlation functions, and when do they factorize? What does it mean? So if I take an, an operator O and measure that at location Z, somewhere in phase space, I can create an, an correlator, which is like, uh, you know, at, at positions vectors, Z1, Z2, until Zn, and I get an end order correlation functions that according to this operator O that I measure. If I'm clever, this operator O, you know, is connected to the interactions and the degrees of freedom of the many-body system that I want, and choosing this operator O basically defines my basis in which I look at my system. Yeah? Now, if I have a correlation function like that, I can always, you know, separate it in two different parts. One is a disconnected part, and one is a connected part of the correlation function. And this disconnected part of the correlation function contains, is fully determined by all lower-order correlation functions. So this disconnected part does not contain any new information, only the new information is in the connected part of this correlation function. So if you want to see, for example, if it's how strong a system is correlated, you have to be able to measure connected correlators, because otherwise you can write down a Gaussian model and basically write down a, a trivial solution. So uh, let's see what does it mean for a four-point correlation function. For a four-point correlation function, you can, this has many, many different components. There's once, you know, there are these trivial components which basically connect, these are only propagators between location one and two, two and three, or these ones, and then there's a, a part which contains interaction between incoming, you know, between this set of, of modes. And this is the connected part of the correlation function, and this is disconnected part of the correlation function, and the fourth order correlator, this is simple to describe down. For the higher order correlation functions, this becomes extremely cumbersome to write down. And if you write it down in this part, you can basically say this is, you know, G2 for 1, 3, G2 of 2, 4, and so on. And then you have this, this connected part of the correlator, which has the vertices in there, and it's an integral over all these parts. You have, it has the, the propagators from the legs of the, co of the correlator and the interaction of the system which it sits in there. Now, the question is, what can we extract? Can we extract these things from an, an experiment? So what does it mean if I make a connected fourth order correlator? It basically means it's a sum of all Feynman diagrams which I cannot cut apart anymore. If I take the sixth order correlator, it's the sum of all these diagrams which I cannot build from you know, two second order diagrams and from fourth order diagrams. So it's genuine three to three interactions. If I take the fourth order correlator, it's genuine four to four interactions. And you know, if I take a have a system which has only two-body interactions, quantum corrections automatically give me all these other higher order corrections. These are genuine quantum effects in the many-body system. How do you probe that? You know, there is a lot of, of, you have to go to statistics books, and this whole library is full of how to do that. It basically means you have to find all, all permutations of the lower orders correlation functions and subtract them, and this can become very, very cumbersome. For instance, for n equals 10 in our system, including all the symmetries that we have, you have about 10 to the 5 terms we have to calculate to be able to extract the connected part of the 10 to the correlation functions. And it's basically the same complexity if you want to do full tomography for 10 qubits. So uh, our system we want to look at are two tunnel coupled one dimensional superfluids, which should be equivalent to the quantum St. Gordon model. So the microscope, this is the microscopic Hamiltonian, and there was this beautiful paper by Kritzev, Polkovnikov, and Demmler, which tells you, has many, makes many assumptions, and then arrives at the, at the quantum St. Gordon model, which is a, a coupled harmonic oscillator, a lattice liquid, and a non-trivial term, which gives a, for the field phi and, and cosine-like potential. And what is beautiful in the experiment, that I have direct parameters here, which you can completely independently evaluate from the data that I have that determines completely the model. And the Saigon model is interesting because it was you know, shown many, many years ago that it's equivalent to many different fundamental models 
in high energy physics, cosmology, and in solid state physics. For example, it's equivalent to the XY model, it's equivalent to Coulomb gas model, it's equivalent to the massive Turing model, and other things. In the experiment, now what we do, we take our atom chip, we create a one dimensional quantum gas on there, we can split it, make it double wise, we have two one dimensional quantum gases, and adjust the tunnel coupling here and make it very, can make a very uh, precise measurement of the interference patterns here. So the experimental procedure is we have our experiment, which is a two tunnel coupled uh, system, which has uh, you know, a varying phase and density fluctuations. We make a unit of operation as a time of flight, make, detect an image, we make an evaluation, we take a single slice out of this image and fit that and extract phase and amplitude, and from that we basically get the phase field, which is this field phi of z, which would be exactly the field that's in the St. Gordon Hamiltonian. And from that, we can then extract the values of the measurement and basically make our estimates from what we want. Now, uh, we do experiments in a trap. So the correlation functions we measure are non-translation invariant. Now, what, co what correlation functions can I evaluate? It turns out that if I make th this approximation, oh, sorry, if I make this approximate, no, yeah, no, sorry, what's the wrong way? So uh, if I would make the, if I, um, it can show that the correlator, the E to the I phi correlator is connected to the field operators and the fourth order would be connected to, you know, the fourth order field operator connected would be, could be measured in this way. The other side, if I directly measure the phase correlations, which is directly, so I have to reconstruct the two pi's in there, then this is directly related to the uh, quasi-particles of the system or to the modes of the system. And the second order, this is, the second order correlator can be created to that, and the fourth order uh, correlator could be created to the quasi-particle scattering, and so on. Now, uh, the question is that since I have the phases, now I can choose what do I evaluate. Uh, usually, it's much easier to evaluate the e to the i phi correlator, but if this is a, a system which is very strongly interacting, it's very easy to see that this e to the i phi correlator is bad, because it, it, con it even in the second order correlator contains all connected parts of the, of the direct interaction of the physics that I want. So this is the wrong thing to evaluate, only if I have Gaussian fluctuation, if a non-interacting system, then the second order correlator is a nice way of the e to the i phi's. So we have to evaluate the phase correlator directly. And then if we do that, we measure the phase correlator, and we take the system in a regime where cosine phi, with this cosine term, is completely irrelevant. Then we see that the full fourth order correlator is identical to the disconnected correlator, which you can calculate from the second order correlation functions, and the connected correlator is zero. If my system, if the cosine phi is completely dominant, then I can approximate the cosine with the quadratic, quadratic part, and again, the correlation functions factorize. And in between, where the cosine phi, this non-trivial term, is very important for the, the state of my, my system, this correlation functions don't factorize, and I get a connected part of the correlation function. So I basically see very strong interactions between the, the modes. Now, we, you can do that, you can do many, many, many of those experiments, and you can characterize everything by this average cosine phi, and you find that the fourth order correlator that you measure is exactly the one they would predict from the quantum St. Gordon model. If you prepare the quantum St. Gordon model, in equilibrium. Now let's look into, we can do this with the sixth order, we can do this with the eighth order, and we can do this with the tenth order correlator. And you see that there are some regions in the system, which is about, you know, average cosine phi, about 0.6 to 0.8, where basically the tenth order correlator contains of order one new information from, compared to what is everything in the all lower order correlators function. So this is an extremely strongly correlated, quantum correlated system basically maximally correlated, because if it's basically all correlation functions contain completely new information. Now, there's a different way of looking at that. Equivalent to looking at correlation functions is looking at full distribution functions. Full distribution functions contain 
also information about all other correlation functions. So you can either choose the correlation function to look at. Sometimes it's easier to see something in the correlation functions. Sometimes it's easier to see the physics in the full distribution functions. So this is the full distribution function, for example, in, the, in a region where you have a strong correlations and you see the full distribution function is non-Gaussian. If you go to a regime where the, the correlations are, start to become Gaussian, like for very strong uh, tunneling and very, very tight phase locking, you see these correlation functions become completely Gaussian. Now, if you look at the system when you make the cooling fast, you find that you suddenly find peaks at plus minus 2 pi. And what are these peaks at plus minus 2 pi? These peaks at plus minus 2 pi are frozen in excitation, topological excitations of the sine Gordon model. And in these interference patterns, it's very nice because you can see them directly. You can see them as a 2 pi phase jump here. And this, is the, you know, and this is basically a topological excitation of the sine Gordon model. Now, you immediately see why it would have been really bad to use the e to the i phi correlators, because the e to the i phi correlators would have put that all back on the main peak. And I would have missed some of the most interesting parts of the model. So uh, now you can look at that. These states are the ones where you have these uh, St. Gordon solitons frozen in. And so if you look at that, what the phase does, it runs over this potential, this effective potential phi. So this state, even if there is no additional excitation, has a higher energy than the state that always stays in there. So in some sense, this is some kind of a vacuum state with a higher energy. And if you would unwind the St. Gordon soliton, I would make a transition back to a lower energy state. So in that sense, I think these states can be viewed in the, in the sense of Sidney Coleman's false vacuum states of a quantum field theory. Now we can go take something like that and try to take out the solitons and see what happens. If I take out, this is for example, these are the, 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 the four point correlator where you have solitons and phonons and you see there's, there's huge uh, values of the four point function. Then I can take out, I can try to take out the solitons and I see that if the phase locking is very strong, the fluctuations that are left over here are basically uh, zero. There's the connected part is zero, so that can be described by the false vacuum state plus the Gaussian model. This cannot be described by Gaussian model because the, the, the uh, is leftover is very, there's very strong leftover connected part. Even if I take away the solitons, you see that lots of the connected part is in, this, in, the, in the topological excitations, but it's still something left over. And that you see what's our noise sensitivity, that's about a factor of 50, that scale is a factor of 50 smaller than here. Yeah? And that scale is, is, is more a factor of uh, 300 smaller than here. So uh, what can you learn from these type of, of experiments? I think we can evaluate very high order correlation functions from experimental data. And I can tell you, to go, I, to go to higher order correlators is not the problem that the experiment cannot do that. It's a problem of the computational complexity. Getting the connected part of the, of the 10 to order correlation functions takes weeks to a month of computation time on a reasonable, you know, a set of a few gaming machines which have a lot of processors. And we had, to we had to cut out every second point. So we made our, assist, our, exp our data evaluation simpler by 2 to the 10. Yeah? And also we made our error bars much larger because of that, because we would have not been able to calculate the 10th order connected part because the computation complexity is just too much to do. Our data we could have probably is good enough to do 12th or 14th or 15th, 16th order but it's, we simply cannot do that, or at least we don't found the good algorithms to be able to do that because it becomes exponentially harder to, make, to get these connected correlators out. The next thing is this full distribution function and connected parts of these high order correlation functions tell us something about the, the quasi particles, the modes, the interaction between the quasi particles and the vacuum states of your effective quantum field theory that describes. So it gives insight in the effective theories describing a many body system. And for the St. Gordon model, this is an 
an emerging model. This is something that's completely different from the microscopic Hamiltonian that I put in there. Yeah? And in that sense, I think it tells you what is needed to describe the data. So if you, somebody says, OK, I want to make a look at some strongly correlated system, and he cannot show you that he can measure connected correlations of the system, I think he cannot, he, he cannot see anything about the important physics of the correlations. Now, from where to go from here, this is now things which we, it's not, it's not published yet, and what, what we are working on, and that's also lots of open problems in there. First of all, so what we, met, what we showed up to now was this connected correlator, this beast here. What you really want to do is to get this gamma function out here, which basically contains the, per, the coupling strength and the parameters of that. This was, you know, Peter asked me, when the first time I talked about that, he asked me the question, can you get out the coupling strength and coupling parameters? So, uh, yes, in principle, you would do that because you would have to invert that integral here. And that you can, in, in that, there, there are procedures in quantum field theory to do that, but they are very much involved. So what we measure, you know, we measure these the connected correlations. They contain these propagators. They contain these legs. So we have to cut, if we want to get the, the direct access to the parameters of my field theory, I have to connect, I have to disconnect these legs. I have to am amputate them. This is called an amputated correlator. And this is best done in momentum representation. And since our system is finite, we have a discrete momentum spectrum of the modes, and you basically transform your correlators into the momentum representation, and then look at that. And what we did, so we did that, and we find really nice, uh, basically that you know, momentum conservation of the scattering of the modes and all of these things comes out. One thing that's really problem is that everybody, you know, all the things that are written down are written down for infinite models and, and things like that. And to get the normalization right, to tell you, you know, which, how big now the coupling constant for all the different scattering things is, this is what we are working on there right now. And we try, to, we try to fix that in the next few weeks or months or something. And I hope maybe by the end of the summer, you can have, a, can have an, an something on the archive. The next thing is, of course, what does these connected correlators tell you about non-equilibrium evolution? The first thing is that we can say, OK, let's take a very strongly correlated system and quench into a free theory. What is happening then? If we quench in a free theory, the connected correlators go, go down. So this is the, the full measured fourth order correlator. This is what you can calculate from the weak decomposition, what you calculate from the second order correlation functions. And this is the connected correlator, and it basically goes down. You can do that, you can calculate again this, this uh, you know, sum of all connected correlators and see, see how much, how important that is, is the, the sum of the connected to some of the, the over correlated and see this was strongly correlated, 70% was in the connected correlator and it goes down and you can describe that evolution, that's quench action evolution in a free system, you can describe that in a nice way. And what, what you also see is that because you know, have a finite system, there's always a bias on there and you can calculate the pseudo-bias of your sample size and do that. Now, non-equilibrium evolution is a little bit, you know, much, much more difficult to, to probe because you need much, much more data than looking at an equilibrium system. But I think we can see how correlations that were very strongly correlated with a quantum free system become Gaussian. How does a Gaussification in, in, a, in a quantum many body system happen? The other thing is now, the much more harder problem is the one if I take a free theory and I quench it to a strongly correlated theory. How does the correlations emerge? How do they come up? So there's a nice paper who studied that uh, in a, not, he studied phase locking. They studied, you know, how does two independent systems, if you bring them together, how do they phase lock? So basically this is the system coming from two, a free theory into the St. Gordon model. And there was this beautiful paper by, by Demra and, and colleagues who said that there's a universal evolution, how this happens. We tried that. And we see the onset, and then something different happens. Uh, with Eugene, we tried to find out what it is. And it's in their approximation, they had to do some approximations, and their approximation could not be solved. Now, then, and then Thomas tried something. He said, wait a minute, at each time position, 
I can completely independently evaluate the parameters of my St. Gordon model. I, I can say, okay, I don't know if this is an equilibrium or non-equilibrium evolution. I evaluate it at time t. What are the parameters of my model? And it turns out that in any evaluation he did, basically, the equilibrium theory gave exactly what the not equilibrium evolution was. And that's now not in a trivial simple parameter, but it's in a parameter that determines the strong correlations in the connected correlation functions. And you do that for many different experiments, and it always happens. We don't know why. It looks like that there is, in the non-equilibrium evolution of an extremely strongly correlated system, you, can, you should be able to write down a hydrodynamic theory that describes the strong correlations and the quantum corrections and all of that. We're trying to extract now the six-order correlator, but the problem is that you know, our statistical samples is, is not as big for, for the non-equilibrium physics and for the other. I mean, there's, you know, one of those data sets takes something like 50,000 to 100,000 experiments to do. So it looks like that non-equilibrium evolution from a free system into a very strongly correlated system proceeds along a path that looks like time local in equilibrium, and that's like reminiscent to hydrodynamics. So the question is that, is there some kind of emergent hydrodynamics in non-equilibrium evolution of strongly correlated systems? That would be nice because we would have some kind of a way of, of finding, you know, a much simpler way of describing these type of things. So we see similar things in, in looking directly at, at uh, a much simpler system, which is a, 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 a Josephson junction where you also see that this thing damps. Maybe give me one second and answer a question from Bill. He asked the question, uh, we have a, a system that defaces, does it ever come back? So we did an experiment in our old non-equilibrium experiments for the latential liquids, where we take, and this is now the second order correlation function, and blue means long range order. And this means that, that you know, we have a decaying correlation function. This is an, a classical density matrix with an, with an exponential decaying correlation function. And if you design your system right, you see a light cone here of emerging of the classical correlation function, and then an inverse light cone, and all the long range comes back, goes down, comes back. And uh, we can measure that. So in some sense, you know, yes, Bill, you were completely right. If you design your system in a correct way, you can see that. And uh, that was, you know, Bernhard Rauer's thesis, and it just came out uh, a few months ago in, in science. And uh, what is amazing is that you can use this free evolution of the in the, in the, in the, the free version, you can think about making a kind of tomography to it. So you can use, you know, usually tomography measure X and P quadratures, but you can use a Hamiltonian here and measure only X, and that Hamiltonian rotates you into P. And the free evolution of a Gaussian theory is exactly that Hamiltonian. So what we did is we took the data from the recurrence experiments and took the fluctuations of the classical density matrix. Because the finite system, these fluctuations contain information about the system, and we can reconstruct the recurrences. Now, this might be a completely new way of looking at getting the density matrix of the, a demo, we make a, demogra an, 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 a tomographic reconstruction of the density matrix of these many body systems, because you basically can use a quantum the free evolution to measure what would be the, what's the density matrix up here. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun stuff to be done here. Good. That leaves me an end. And let's leave up that here. Okay. Uh, thank you.